My friends, it's been a few weeks since I started working on this strange diorama, or as I like to call it, Savior. I've painted and weathered the A7V tank, painted the figures, and even before that, I constructed the diorama itself. But it's in its raw state, full of textures and different materials, so tonight we're finishing this large project by painting the groundwork and the trench. This scene is rather complex and huge, so I'll prime it with a spray can. It's not the cleanest process in the world, so I took the diorama outside to get some, you know, sunlight. This way I could get the priming stage out of the way in a few minutes. Spraying it with an airbrush would cost me at least an hour and a pair of lungs. But still, there were a few places where the spray can didn't reach, so these were quickly treated with an airbrush. Not outside anymore, of course. The surface is now unified and the black primer will allow me to add some artificial shadows here and there. To paint the groundwork, I decided to use multiple colors, starting with the darkest one. Instead of spraying it as a thick, opaque layer, I applied it in a random, semi-translucent layer and most importantly, tried spraying it directly from above. This way, the texture of the ground would cast its own shadows, making the individual clumps of earth and other details more visible. So that's the first color, made with XF52 flat earth. The second color was much lighter, and it'll cover most of the exposed terrain. And by exposed, I mean exposed sunlight. Consider it as a highlight applied on the ground. This is actually the same mixture I used for pre-dusting on the tank, and that's very important. Why? Because if the weathering on the model matches the color on the ground, the model will become more integrated with the diorama. If these colors were mismatched, the tank would look completely out of place, I think. Oh, and it's not just a single color that I used here, it's my own dust concoction mix from these paints. The final layer was a more vivid tone, because although I used the same color as on the tank, the black primer undercoat made it look much colder, like some grayish, ashy dust. This way I could add more saturation in the most crucial places, and this is one of the main advantages of painting the model first, because on the model you often have to use a specific earth color that will create nice contrasts on the tank's paint job. It's much easier to match the groundwork with a weathered model than trying to weather a model using a painted diorama as a reference point. Anyway, let's consider the groundwork base coated, and this final layer was XF57 buff. Until now I tried to avoid spraying too much paint on the wooden parts, because that would nullify the black primer underneath. Instead, I could now carefully spray them in a very pale color that will act as a good foundation for more precise painting. It's not a big deal if some of the paint lands on the terrain, all of these colors are pretty similar after all, and besides, everything will be refined with paintbrushes. It's just about blocking in the basic colors, defining textures and volumes and, well, getting rid of the black undercoat. And our wood color was XF52 Dectan. So that's the base coat out of the way. I think it looks pretty exciting already, although there was no detail painting involved so far. But you see how painting the ground makes it look more exciting than using raw materials. And most importantly, this way you can fine tune the colors so every component of the diorama will be in harmony. Okay, so let's now paint the trench walls. Honestly, I wasn't sure how to proceed here, so I did something highly unusual. A small test section, where I tried different paints and approaches until I was satisfied with the result. Most of the heavy lifting will be done using acrylic paints, and my aim here was a grayish, desaturated wood bark texture. Of course, reference pictures were a great help here, and luckily, you can easily find colored photos of trench replicas on the internet. Whenever I have to paint some wood, my first choice is old wood from Vallejo. That usually applies to wooden components on tanks, though, and the results are best when it's applied over a black-brown undercoat. However, note how I'm applying it in quick, uneven passes. That's very important if you want to keep your sanity. The second layer, again, following my standard procedures, is Iraqi sand. This is a pretty warm, sandy color, however, when it's applied on top of old wood, diluted with water of course, together they create this pretty rich, yet not overly saturated effect. 
Again, this combination works best over a dark base coat, which isn't the case here, but we still have the remaining colors. Now I'm using Burnt Umber to add some darker texture. As I was painting this thing, I kept wondering why didn't I start with the darkest color and worked my way towards the lightest. And I still don't know the answer. <laughs> this approach just felt right, I guess. The wooden trunks received more of the dark color to separate them from the thinner branches and whatnot, I don't know what they really are, that were used to build the woven walls, right? And finally, well, <laughs> almost finally, a very diluted random coat of light mud. This is where I'm starting to add the less saturated colors, because my goal here is to simulate some smooth tree bark. And that's always more grey than brown. Okay, I know, it looks pretty weird so far, but uh, it'll soon all click together. Let's now take a quick break from acrylics and put some of these enamels to good use. The entire wall received a bunch of heavy washes. Mainly wash for German dark yellow and earth from the ammo nature effects range. Two goals that I'm trying to achieve here. First and most important, make the earth behind the wall darker and bring out its texture. Now I'm guessing it would be pretty dark thanks to the moisture, and this way the woven walls will stand out even better. And the second goal is to subtly blend some of the visible brush strokes I made with acrylics, and also adding uneven dirt passes on the wooden parts. To emphasize the effect even further, dark wash for green vehicles was applied over the still wet surface. This is called the wet blending method, where the paints melt into each other so to say. The tree trunks also received some heavier washes and here I just couldn't resist, <laughs> so I added some stains with light slimy grime. This is a completely personal choice, but I really like adding moss on stuff, especially wooden stuff. I don't know, it just makes the wood look woodier. <laughs> and to finish them off, the dark wash was blended towards the bottom, creating a more dramatic effect. But I also think the wood would be affected by the constant moisture in the trench. So let's now switch back to acrylics and mix a very light grey color from graphite and light mud. Now we're creating the final texture, so I'm trying to be more precise. Basically, the paint doesn't have to be very diluted and the brush is not very loaded with it. I'm trying to make thin brush strokes following the bark texture and also letting the brush skip over the surface so to say, creating a more random and natural looking effect. This way I can also tidy up some of the enamel washes and make the wood stand out from the moist ground behind it. The final, and now it's totally final, layer is deck 10 and I'm applying it as a sort of highlight in very controlled amounts. The woven walls create these waves, right? And that's an excellent guideline for painting because I can focus on the lightest colors where the wood is bulging out the most, leaving the darker colors in the more recessed areas. And because references were essential during this process, well, it's not really visible in this shot, but I found pretty large accumulations of moss on those trench replicas that I mentioned earlier. I'll just never pass up the opportunity to add some slimy grime to wooden surfaces. But I mean, come on, it does make it look more lively, doesn't it? Okay, so that's the trench wall finished. Uh, too bad not much of it will be visible in the end, but at least it's here for everyone to see. Also, while I was at it with the acrylics, I painted every accessory and piece of gear with them. Well, I'll get to that part later in the video, although it's nothing new or groundbreaking. Uh, let's instead get the trench done by finishing the bottom section. The raised walkways were painted with enamels, and this was a sort of warm-up before painting the battlefield. I used Rainmarks effects for the lightest to dry tones, Earth for the medium tones, and Wash for German yellow for the shadows and moist ground. All of them were applied using wet blending, which not only makes the process faster, but the results are also very authentic. The walkway at the bottom is made from planks, and I wanted to give them a slightly different color and texture compared to the walls. So I started by giving them a heavy but uneven layer of light mud. My goal here was a very pale grayish tone of old dusty wood. As such, the top layer was very bright, a mixture of deck tan and graphite. Because these would receive a lot of traffic, I added some chipping effects or exposed fresh wood, mostly around the edges and towards the middle. 
Weathering was carried out with only two enamel paints, and it was just about adding some earth tones. I placed some loose debris here during the construction phase, so that acted as a good roadmap. A dark patch down the middle was painted with the brown wash, because this is where most dirt would be accumulated, at least I think. The last step was picking out some of the stones in random colors, although I mostly used deck tan and light mud. That's actually something I also noticed in reference pictures. In many cases, there would be a ton of gravel and large bright rocks thrown about in the trenches. I guess a byproduct of digging into the ground. So that's it, the trench is now finished and ready to be populated, so to say, by the tank. We can even consider this the first chapter of this video, and the second part will be painting the battlefield. Here I started with enamels on the groundwork itself. I used the same paints and the same wet blending technique, but note that I've put the tank temporarily in place here. That's a very important thing for me, because it acts as a reference point for the earth zones, especially its running gear and tracks. This way I can pretty much perfectly match the dust and mud effects right around the tank, making it integrated into the scene as much as possible. The airbrushed gradients can be enhanced even further on some terrain features such as this crater, blending the lightest tone around its edge, the darker tone in the middle, and pulling the bottom with a brown wash. Check out this time lapse and how I added more earth gradients on the hill, focusing on the darkest tones near the trench. Uh, two reasons here. Shading, but also the moisture would naturally flow down the slope, collecting at the edge of the trench. And that pretty much takes care of the earth colors, everything seems to be in check, I think, so I can paint all the debris laying on the ground. All these broken pieces were inspired by a historical picture, and I'm suspecting they came from a blown up trench. Maybe. <laughs> I'm not sure, but luckily, as a modeler, you don't always have to know the how and why, just that it's there. I used only two colors to paint the debris, old wood and Iraqi sand. The first reason, to preserve my sanity, and the second, to give the battlefield more color, otherwise the entire scene would be a mass of grayish brown tones. Well, it'll be like that anyway, but you know, small colorful details can make the whole picture look more balanced. It's interesting because I wasn't looking forward to these steps, it just seemed daunting and exhausting, but actually it went much smoother and faster than the trench itself. However, after all of this detail painting, I really felt like the scene was missing some vividness. So I gave it a very careful round of airbrushing with a very diluted buff color, focusing it mostly on the raised portions and areas with dry earth. Also, trying my best not to paint over the previously painted pieces of wood and stones, but because the paint was so diluted, it was almost impossible to mess things up. Remember what I said about wooden moss? Yeah, once again, I couldn't resist. <laughs> so, I mentioned the tarps and stowage and whatnot a while ago, and actually this was the most relaxing part for me. The painting techniques are the same as I've shown on the figures a week ago, because I was able to appreciate some of the stowage with the airbrush using the deck tan color when I was spraying the trench walls, and when that wasn't possible, I used the traditional method, so painting the tarp with a dark color and then making it lighter for highlights, in this specific case, field grey highlighted with sunny skin tone. The large wooden cross was treated with some heavy enamel washes. Brown wash for German yellow was used to bring out all the wood grain texture, but to also add contrast between the individual pieces. My trademark effect was added as well. Uh, did I mention how much I like painting moss on wooden surfaces? And also, some subtle rust stains around the nail holes. Whenever I add some kind of small detail during the construction stage, I make sure to emphasize it with paints. So that's the whole scene from top to bottom. And... I think we're looking pretty good here. Oh, what's that down there you ask? Well, of course, I couldn't not add some water. That's like the most World War I thing ever, right? My previous diorama was all about water, so I already knew the basics, the do's and don'ts. So after taping the crater I waterproofed the bottom with AK still water and left it to fully dry. In the meantime, I prepared the epoxy resin. 
same one as in that sunken Mark IV diorama. So two component resin from AK and the only thing you need to know is the 2 to 1 mixing ratio. So 6 milliliters of resin and 2 milliliters of hardener. Stir, not shake, this way we avoid too many air bubbles and it's ready for some color. I used khaki before, so to change things up I went with field grey this time. This is a small puddle, so it's supposed to be that tiny cherry on top of this diorama. And I already had a lot of experience from my previous project. In other words, nothing could go south here. But guess what? It did. Yeah, the resin leaked pretty hard on me. Luckily, I noticed it almost immediately. And at this point, I knew the effect was ruined and my attempts at fixing it wouldn't lead to great results. But don't worry, I tried my best. So after removing as much of the resin as possible and re-taping the crater again, I repeated the process. This time, everything seemed pretty good, so I proceeded to remove the air bubbles with a blowtorch per usual, but guess what happened then? <laughs> it started spilling out of the crater. <laughs> well, long story short, it happened one more time, and for my fourth and final attempt, I made a new mixture, this time with khaki drap, because the previous one was too green anyway. So to save my own skin I brushed some clear varnish on the side and flat varnish on this part where it spilled out of the crater. Then I super glued a few clumps of earth on top of that, sort of, you know, enlarging the edge of the crater and sprinkled some more dirt over a layer of super glue. The water surface was treated with AK's clear water gel. This would even out the edges of the puddle while adding some realistic water ripples at the same time. While the gel was drying I painted the earth using acrylic paints, because I've suffered too much emotional trauma to mess around with enamels. Also, I had just enough after this misadventure, so I just called it a day and super glued the tank in place. And of course, the figures as well. The gel was still drying at this point, so in the meantime I painted the sides with a nice, thick coat of Tamiya flat black. Not just repairing the damaged area, but also cleaning up the rest, where I messed up the sides with an airbrush and enamel paints. And here's the final look on that unfortunate puddle. I know, it ain't much, but it was an honest effort, okay? <laughs> and with that, this video has come to its end, my dear friends. But stay for a little longer and take a look at the finished diorama, okay? Uh, well, one thing is for sure. Even when I was building it, I kept telling myself how much time and work it takes. And in the end, it's just a trench, a bunch of dirt and broken twigs, but still, it takes so much effort to make it look proper, you know? And it was the same as I was painting it. A ton of work, but the color palette remained mostly the same on the entire scene. Uh, one thing kept bothering me, that the tank would stand out too much because of its vivid camouflage, but then... I realized, you know, hey, it's integrated into the scene with dust, mud and debris and, well, it ain't my problem that the Germans painted it in such an abstract, totally out of place camouflage, right? A British Mark IV painted completely brown would be right at home in this trench. But anyway, I'm probably rambling. Uh, I'm just glad to have another diorama in my collection, you know. And I've been stoked for the next one for a while now because I have the entire thing planned out. We'll skip a few decades forward and this time it's gonna be a World War II scene, but trust me, it's gonna be epic. <laughs> so now I just wanna say thank you for watching my friends and I hope you found this video helpful or at least interesting to watch. And also a huge thank you to my patrons who make this show possible. If you like what I'm doing and want to get more of it and in return support my work, you can go to my Patreon page and see what kind of rewards would you like. I'm posting there almost every day with updates from my workbench, we can get in touch through DMs and emails, I'm posting one week early ad free videos so you could watch the next one right now, also these beautiful studio photos that you can download in full resolution, and last but not least, some real life references for dioramas, sceneries and landscapes. And of course, small 3D models for detailing your tanks and dioramas. Okay, friends, so now I gotta clean my workbench and slowly start working on the next project. 
Maybe I'll release something unusual as the next video, I'm not sure yet, but I'm sure there will be a technique focused tutorial in the nearby future. We haven't done that in a while. And I hope you know what to do in the meantime. Stay safe, stay awesome, build your models, don't just collect them, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers!